All right, good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. So before we begin, uh, a couple things in the news, or one thing in the news. Uh, we talked about this, not to hit the bacteria over the head again and again, but it seems to be a popular topic. Um, talking about, we talked about antibiotics and how, especially early in life, and how that's a factor that kind of molds your bacterial populations. And um, this was a study, just came out yesterday, or was published in the New York Times. You know, the press picked up on it. And basically they looked at 163,000 kids, okay? And uh, looked at basically the number of courses of antibiotics they got. And what they found is the more antibiotics they got, the more they weighed later in life. So in other words, it predisposed, the more antibiotics you get when you're younger, the more likely you are to become obese when you're older, okay? And so this kind of follows up on some of the stuff we talked about. And I think we'll be seeing more and more stuff, not only on obesity, but asthma and allergies and who knows, cancer, whatever else it may be. But um, this is kind of interesting. Um, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is, so this chapter we're talking about metabolism, right? And the next chapter we're going to talk about energy balance. So we talk about food intake and what controls calories in, calories out. Um, but all of that really relies on the stuff we're talking about today, this whole generating energy from food or burning energy. And one of the concepts that I talked about last time was this electron transport chain and this uncoupling thing. And when it comes to dietary supplements for weight loss, there are, as you know, if you go to any pharmacy, GNC, anywhere, there's like, you know, there's a whole list of them. Or you turn on Dr. Oz if three in the afternoon or whatever, whenever the hell he's on. Um, and, you know, he's always marketing some supplement for weight loss, right? The problem is most of these have been poorly studied. And I'm putting a website up here in case anyone is actually interested in these types of supplements. This is the National Institutes of Health Office of Dietary Supplements. So these guys are actually like a legitimate source. And they would actually fund research to study these. But they have a nice summary here of a lot of different weight loss supplements, if you scroll down, like bitter orange and caffeine and all of these things. And the reason I'm pointing this out um, is because if you'll see, a lot of them will show, um, no, I can't find it, like this, ephedra, OK? This was a big popular one, and a bunch of people died from it. Um, you can see thermogenesis. So often when something says thermogenesis, they're talking about that concept we talked about in class where you, where the electron transport chain doesn't capture it as ATP and you get heat instead. Thermogenesis means heat production, right? And so that's exactly what they're talking about. And so um, the ephedra, I don't know if you guys remember, this has been quite some time. A lot of people were using this and it did promote weight loss. Um, but this and many other drugs well, also, you can actually feel yourself getting hot if you take enough of it. And what do you think happens if you take too much of it? You die, right? And people did this back. In the 30s, they identified compounds that cause those, those hydrogens to leak out and you don't get any energy. And that's the same thing that happens with um, there's certain poisons, like cyanide. This is an inhibitor of that electron transport chain. You've seen all the James Bond movies, the spy movies, where they, he puts the pill under his tongue and he dies within seconds. We basically do not store ATP in our bodies, so we need to make it constantly. So if you inhibit that electron transport chain, you die within seconds, okay? And some of these drugs that, they don't necessarily inhibit it, but they, they make it very ineffective because everything's produced heat instead of, we capture as energy. And that's how some of these work, but there's obviously some very serious um, consequences to these. But it, it, this is a good website if you're interested in any of these dietary supplements. Question? Yes? Um, so with the ephedra, if you took too much of it, um, would it work if you took like, smaller? So, so, so some of it can. Um, again, many of these do a lot of different things in the body, and so there's lots of things that can go wrong. But um, there are some, this is a big area of research for weight loss right now. It's trying to find ones that kind of uncouple a little bit without going crazy. The, the problem, and, and they found one back in the 30s, and like they, they estimated like 100,000 people use this, okay? And um, there were several people that died because all of our tolerances to different drugs are very different. So we could give the same dose to everybody in here. Some would be perfectly fine, lose a little weight. Some wouldn't respond at all. Some would die, okay? 
we're not going to do this, don't worry. I get bad evaluations when I kill students. Um, so that's part of the problem. But, but this is a big area, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this brown fat stuff. A lot of people are interested in this, so I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about this. Um, I teach a graduate level class, and we spend a whole lecture talking about brown fat, so I think it's an interesting topic. So this, um, let me fill you in. You maybe have seen uh, radiographs like this, and this is one where you maybe seen someone with a tumor or something like that, right? What, what they do in a study like this is they inject glucose into these people, and they put a little tag on it so that they can actually measure the glucose. So the black is the glucose going up into tissues. And tissues that are very metabolically active, like a tumor, okay? We'll talk about cancer later on, but tumors love glucose. They just suck it up and use it really fast. Um, they will light up. They will turn black in this, all right? You can also see a little bit up here, it's kind of cut off, but the brain, it's pure black. So your brain is constantly taking up a lot of glucose. So this isn't a normal person. The only really places you see it is a little bit in the kidneys here, which is um, common. This is a person that's been exposed to the cold, okay? Just for, uh, I think there was, I don't remember the exact details of how long, but it was like a couple hours every day for a few days. And all of the black stuff you see here, this is their heart, actually, because the heart's starting to take up glucose. But all of this stuff along the spine, along the neck, uh, uh, the chest area, that is all the brown fat that I talked about. So again, this is the stuff that's using a lot of energy to produce heat, okay? And what's interesting about this, going back to the whole weight loss thing, is if you look and you measure the brown adipose tissue, what we call activity, it's, you could think of it as the amount of brown adipose you have because it's usually pretty active. And you look at how much energy these people are expending. So this is the calories they're burning. You can see there's a relationship here. So the more brown fat, the more energy expenditure you have. And this is just people, if I randomly scanned all of you and plotted you on here, you probably look something like the spectrum. So when you don't have much, if any, brown fat, and there are some people that don't have any, you know, you're usually down here. But as you have more brown fat, you're burning more energy. Okay? Because that food that's coming in is producing heat. And you're burning, burning, burning. And also we know that this, as I mentioned, is related to ambient temperature, so the temperature outside. And I'll show you a graph on this in a minute. Meaning the warmer it is outside, the less brown fat you have. Yes? Yes, yes, there is, absolutely. So you see women right here. Women have more brown fat than men do, okay? Women have typically more fat than men do, right? Um, Women are just cold people. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, and inevitably, when all of you, many of you get married, your spouse will be the complete opposite of you. It's almost, it's, it's kind of like a law of nature. One of you has to be hot and one of you has to be cold. It does flip. There are other times. Why is that? Um, you know, the only, the only rational explanation I can think of is that, so we, when we talk about metabolism, different types of tissues have different, what we call metabolic rates. So muscle, brain, liver, very metabolically active. So if you take like a gram of muscle versus a gram of fat, that muscle is going to burn way more energy than the fat. The fat just kind of sits there. It doesn't do much. Okay? So men typically have more muscle. And so even at rest, even when you're not exercising, they're going to be burning more energy. And in the process, you produce heat. Okay? So remember when I talked about um, capturing like 40% of our energy is ATP and the rest is heat? And if you think about that, when you go to the gym and you exercise, why do you start sweating? Right? Because you get hot. Because you're trying to get all that ATP, but in the process, you're getting all that heat that goes with it. That's why you sweat. Okay? When you get on the treadmill, that first minute, you're burning just as many calories as you are an hour later. But obviously, you're not sweating that first minute versus later because you're trying to adapt and, and uh, evaporate the sweat to cool off because you're getting all the heat that goes with it. Yeah? Did you? Because uh, fat does so much more in the body than, than I mean. I mean for, for like thermal purposes. Oh, for thermal purposes? Absolutely. Um, the, less, the less white fat you have and more muscle you have definitely predicts how much energy you're going to expend. 
we'll talk about this in the next chapter where we talk about energy balance. But if you want the best predictor of how many calories you're going to burn in a day, just if you're sitting, not doing anything, it's the amount of we call lean body mass, which is mostly muscle. I mean, you can't control bone too much and things like that. So muscle is the best predictor. Can't control brain size too much. You can't think a little harder and make your brain grow. Can't make your liver grow without getting it fat. Um, muscle is the thing we can control, and that's the, the active metabolic active tissue, even when you're not exercising. Okay, so just at rest, it's burning a lot of energy. That's that's what I would guess. But with that said, there's still I don't know whether it's genetic hormones. Who no, I mean, obviously there's certain times in women's life where she's very hot, right? Um, and I'm referring to menopause, not anything else. Um, so there's lots of crazy hormone changes, gender changes going on, um, and, and everybody's different. So going back to this concept of, of brown fat and obesity, so this looks at, um, I guess I don't have these laid, this is um, BMI, which is a measure of a body mass index. We'll talk about this next chapter. Um, this is how we categorize people. It's basically weight and height ratios. Um, and then body fat. You can see the same. I'll just use body fat here. This is brown adipose activity. You have zero up to a bunch, okay? And body fat. So in other words, the less brown adipose you have, um, uh, the more body fat you're going to have. Your body fat goes down as you get more um, brown adipose. So these two track together. So again, if you have more brown adipose, you're not capturing the ATP to use to make fat or whatever. They extend, you're just burning it. You're just dissipating it. Yeah? So if you have a low body fat percentage, but um, higher BMI, like roughly? So, so, so this can happen. So do you know how BMI is calculated? It's basically your height weight ratio. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But some people, it's a very crude measure because you can have someone that has um, a big BMI but can still be lean, like a, say a pro athlete or a football player or something like that. Um, so your question is what happens in regards to energy, like brown or energy expenditure or brown fat or, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Well, I was just thinking, let's say someone had a body fat percentage of like 10 or 12, which is pretty high. It's like 1,000 on the brown adipose activity, mm -hmm. but their BMI was roughly 30, and that's almost close to zero. That doesn't really line up. No, I, I would, I would, I don't know, but I would, I would go with body fat. Body fat is actually an actual measure of body fat. BMI is a really crude measure because, yeah, it, it's not a good predictor. And, and this is true if you look at people that are really lean. So when I was in college, I actually worked out with a guy that was a wrestler. And if there's any wrestlers in there, I don't mean this offensive, but you guys are all nuts, all right? This guy, he was a really good wrestler. And um, he worked out with some people that were on the Olympics. And some of these guys had body fats down to like 2%. I mean, these people could literally walk on the bottom of a pool. They were so dense. And I don't mean that intellectually. I mean that physically. Um, and so, but how do you regulate your temperature? Right? Body fat, A, is insulating. And, um, and that, when you're that lean, you probably don't have, I would guess, not much brown fat as well. So we know that people, there is a point where you can become too lean and you have a hard time regulating body temperature when in a cold exposure or something like this. So... Anyway, and this is adjusted, uh, this does, as I mentioned, it's, it's responsive to temperature. So this looks at people, um, this is the brown adipose depots, so they just count the number of depots they see in spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And you can see these people live in a, you know, you could say a climate somewhat like ours, uh, at least it's the summer, you know, the June, July, August are the warm months. And you can see in summer it's the lowest and the winter is the highest, okay? And then same, same thing down here. So this does track um, with temperature. Now, keep, again, keep in mind, we're not the same as we were 200 years ago. And there's actually, we're always at 70 degrees, it seems like, right? And there's a lot, some people that would argue that this is actually a contributor to the obesity epidemic. That, you know, 200 years ago, we had to burn more energy to just keep our body temperature, just to stay warm. But now... You guys are all just sitting there in a long sleeve shirt. You're totally comfortable, right? If we were doing this outside right now or in a month from now, you'd be burning a heck of a lot more energy. Now, is that the driving factor which has caused obesity? No. But it, it, it could very well be a contributor. So it's an interesting concept. I think that's all I had. Oh, and then the other thing for you guys to look forward to is we know as you get older, 
that your metabolism slows down. And we say metabolism, generally refer to the rate at which you burn calories, okay? So your energy expenditure. And this, um, this is the total intensity of brown adipose positive depose. So that you think of it as brown adipose activity, so to speak. Just looking at people across age, and as you get older, the brown fat goes down. And this is probably a contributor to the decrease in metabolism. Anybody else know what another contributor would be? Why your metabolism slows down when you age besides this? What else do you have less of as you age? I just talked about it. Muscle, right. As you age, you lose muscle mass. Okay, this is a fact um, for the average person. You can you know, do things to try and retain that, but that also decreases your metabolism. So um, I guess when you get older, lift weights and stay outside in a t-shirt in winter, I guess it'll keep you warm or keep, you, uh, keep your metabolism up. I don't know. Anyway, any other questions on that before I move on? No? All right. So last time we ended, we talked about the whole, pretty much the whole lecture was we talked about carbohydrates, okay? We talked about how we, we ingest carbohydrates, um, they get to the cell, and then how we get energy from them. We talked about aerobic metabolism using oxygen, and we ended talking about anaerobic metabolism. And the main highlights, we talked about the pathways of glycolysis and that little transition reaction in the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle, and then electron transport chain. So those are all very, very important concepts for you guys to know. Now we're going to switch over and talk about getting energy from some other nutrients in our diet, and then also some anabolic processes, okay? So most of what we've talked about so far are catabolic. We're breaking things down and getting energy. So fat is another primary source of energy. And I've, I've mentioned this before in class, but at any given moment, probably most of us are burning about an equal mix of fat and carbs, very little protein, okay? That varies depending on your diet a little, but most of the time um, we're burning quite a bit of fat. And so uh, where we get these fats from, um, if we store them in our body, obviously we can get them from diet, okay? But usually even most of the stuff in the diet um, ends up in adipose tissue or various places, and then we break them down. And this process is called lipolysis. I think I mentioned this before in the fat chapter. This is where we, we store fat in triglycerides and we break them down into these fatty acids, okay? Um, and then these fatty acids go in the blood and they can go to any tissue that needs them, the heart, the liver, um, whatever it may be. And the process of breaking fat down to get energy is something called, we, it's, it's an oxidation, but we call it beta oxidation, all right? So it's, there's other types, but they're very minor. This is the, the main one. And this happens in the mitochondria. So mitochondria is kind of the, you always hear it referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, right? This is because where we get most of our energy there. This is where the citric acid cycle is. It's where the electron transport chain is. It's where fat oxidation is, okay? And so the fatty acids go into the mitochondria. Just a, a little side note, that carnitine, which is one of the nutrients we're gonna be talking about later on, actually um, is important for getting the fat into the mitochondria. And if you're limiting in this, it can actually limit how much fat you can burn, which if you're an athlete or somebody like that can be important. And this is actually used as a supplement sometimes. Um, the end product of this, which I'll show you in a minute, is again, acetyl-CoA, right? And um, the other thing I'll show you is that fats are very energy dense. And I've told you this before, we get nine calories, right, versus four for fat versus carbs. And I'll show you why that is. Okay, so this is a very complicated uh, pathway. I, I, I just want you to focus on one thing here. So we start up here with a fatty acid, okay? So Fatty acids come in, we talked about chain length. This is like 16 carbons. You don't need to know all these steps here, all right? But what you do need to know is when a fatty acid comes in, it gets broken down. And what happens is through this pathway, you chop off two carbons at a time, every time. So you come down here, two carbons of acetyl CoA are lost. And then this fatty acid goes back up and comes back down. You chop off another two. Then it goes back through. You chop off another two. So all you're left with is basically a bunch of acetyl coys. Right? So that's how a fat is broken down. Very different than glucose, where it's just one and it splits apart. This is a series of steps. And so this kind of mimics it. You lose two, go down, lose two, lose two, lose two. And that's what you're left with. 
So the important points of this pathway, the highlights. So each cycle of beta oxidation, just kind of reiterating what I said, results in the fatty acid becoming two carbons shorter. Okay? So we're chopping it two at a time. There's no other way. You don't take three or four or five. And this pathway produces acetyl-CoA, a lot of it. Okay? So if you have a 16 carbon fatty acid, you get eight acetyl-CoA's. Remember, glucose, you only get two. So that's a lot more energy right there, just in acetyl-CoA. In addition, if you look at this pathway up here and look at some of the things that are produced, um, you see right here, you get NADH, which if you remember is very important for um, generating energy in the electron transport chain. And you get FADH2, which is up here at this step. Again, you don't need to know these enzymes, where exactly these things are happening, but I want you to know what, what's coming out of this and why it's important. So acetyl-CoA, NADH, and FADH2 are the main end products of all this. And your inputs, obviously, would be you know, FAD, NAD, fatty acid, but I'm not going to focus on that. Okay, so when you burn uh, a single fatty acid, here's what you get. If you go through that cycle eight times, for example, right, you get roughly 106 ATP. All right, you remember what we got for glucose? It's like 32, right? Or 20, yeah, 32. So you get a lot more energy here. Now there are a few more lost uh, through various other steps. You lose a couple ATP too, but don't, don't worry about that. And the other thing I'll point out, sometimes certain books give you a different number. They say you get three ATP or two or whatever. Don't focus on this. This is just minor stuff. The point is, is that um, through this process, you get a, a lot of energy produced, and that's why fat is so energetically dense. Um, so the way fat feeds into this, all the cycles we talked about here, is it comes into acetyl-CoA here, all right? And once it's into acetyl-CoA, it can enter the citric acid cycle and go around. Now, the one thing I didn't, didn't talk about when we were talking about glucose metabolism, we talked about glucose, we focused on this pathway here too. Glucose gets broken down into acetyl-CoA. And it definitely does do that a lot of times, but glucose can also enter the citric acid cycle at other points. And it supplies um, other, uh, how do I say, intermediates in the citric acid cycle. Like, um, for example, when acetyl-CoA comes in, it gets formed to this compound citrate. In order to have that, you have to have oxaloacetate. And pyruvate, or uh, glucose metabolism can lead to this. So what this is trying to say is that um, the glucose is really important for keeping the machinery going here because in order for the cycle to run around, you have to have all these other things. Because remember, when acetyl-CoA comes in, everything after one spin of this is lost. The carbons are gone, the oxygen is gone, everything is gone. And so you're starting around. Um, so you need to have these substrates. And so those mostly come from glucose metabolism. Some from amino acids too, but mostly glucose. And the point uh, I want to make here is something called ketogenesis. And so what would happen if you have a lot of fatty acids coming in, but you have very little glucose in your diet? Then these fatty acids can't enter this cycle very well because you don't have enough of these other substrates in the cycle to carry the acetyl-CoA. Think of it as you know, a bunch of horses going around in a circle and you have a bunch of riders here coming in, right? If you can only put as many of these riders on as the number of horses you have. So if you're limiting in the horses, the riders can't ride anything, right? So the carbohydrates provide this. They provide the horses. But if you have a whole bunch of people here, riders, or a whole bunch of cedar quay, it can't get in. And so something has to happen to it. And so what happens is <coughs> it forms what we call ketone bodies. How many of you have ever heard of ketosis? Okay, most, a lot of you. So what ketosis is, it's basically, I, I think of it as like an overflow too. If this is a dam, a limiting step getting in here, and you get too much acetyl-CoA, it has to go somewhere else, and it overflows. And it overflows to the pathway of forming ketone bodies. Okay? This primarily happens in the liver. And these little ketones are acids. 
and they go out in the blood and as you could imagine if you get a lot of acids going in the blood you can get something called ketoacidosis which is very bad it can affect your blood pH and cause all sorts of problems and this is a big deal in things like uh, diabetes where glucose metabolism is all screwed up so you don't have enough glucose coming into here or um, also we talked about those high protein low carb diets the hallmark of those diets is if you guys remember we talked about is bad breath right you can tell if someone's on a one of those diets because they have bad breath and the bad breath comes from ketones okay so the ketones you can smell on someone's breath because they're not eating enough carbs in the diet so all of this fat that's being burned a lot of it goes to ketone bodies and you can smell it okay and again there's some some clinical consequences to this whole process So to give you an idea um, of how this would happen in a type 1 diabetic or someone on a very low carb intake. So in either one of these cases, if you're type 1 diabetic, you physically cannot make insulin because the cells, your pancreas, is not functioning. Okay? So no matter, even if you eat carbs, nothing's going to happen. If you're eating a low carb diet, obviously you're not going to make insulin either because there's no signal. Glucose sti stimulates insulin production, so if there's no glucose, um, it's not going to happen. So what happens as a result of that is when you don't have insulin around, that's a signal of fasting, right? It's, let's break down energy. And so when there's no insulin, it tells your fat to break down. So it signals to the adipose tissue that there's not enough energy around, break down fat. And so the adipose tissue breaks down this fat, goes into the blood, and it gets, goes through oxidation and t through ketone body production, okay? And then um, once these ketone bodies are produced, they can go around and do, um, you know, cause ketoacidosis and um, all sorts of things. All right? So that's kind of the main thing. And again, the carbohydrates here become limiting in the cycle because insulin also tells the cells to take up glucose into the cycle. And if there's no signal there, there's no glucose there. So it can't run. Does this make sense? Okay. So I guess the, the take home point here is that fat metabolism is dependent on glucose metabolism to some degree okay and when you're short of glucose or short of insulin it really changes the way you metabolize fat and a lot of people would argue that a low carb diet you know you're burning more fat and so that's how you lose weight in reality I mean that's true in reality you're just eating less calories on a low carb diet that's what causes the overall weight loss okay any questions on fat metabolism no? All right. So now we're going to talk about protein metabolism. I know I already defined this, but you guys can, you'll, you'll really remember it because I defined it twice now. So um, deamination is really when we remove the nitrogen group from an amino acid, okay? And um, then we're left with um, basically the carbons, and then we get, we get rid of this ammonia, the nitrogen group here. And as I mentioned, what happens is that ammonia gets secreted as urea. So if we look over here in the diagram, I think it makes more sense here. Um, we have uh, our amino acid here. We lose that amine group. It goes to urea, all right, in the liver. This goes to the kidneys, and the kidneys excrete it out, out of the body. Okay, so these amino acids are coming into the liver. They get catabolized, um, and then we get rid of this nitrogen product there. Um, the carbon here, I think I have on the next slide, yeah. Um, I'll talk about this in the next slide. But this is how we get rid of this ammonia part, or the mean part. Okay? It usually ends up out of the body. Now, some of it can be recycled and go into making other proteins, too. But if you have too much, it goes down this way. So the, the, the carbon skeleton, so what we have left, if we chop off the nitrogen, then it looks kind of like a carbohydrate. And uh, what we do with it is two, there's two options, okay? And we can categorize, we have 20 different amino acids, some of them what we call ketogenic, and some we can call glucogenic. All right? So the ketogenic ones um, go to acetyl-CoA, which then we can generate energy from. All right? We, again, we've talked about acetyl-CoA. Now, there are some of them that are gluconeogenic or glucogenic, and these can actually go into the citric acid cycle in a different way in those, uh, those four carbon molecules and be used to make glucose. And this is really important 
if you're fasting or you're on a low carb diet, for example, I talked about um, use converting protein to glucose. That's exactly what's happening here. Some of these amino acids will actually spare you um, or form glucose. And this is also happening if you just stop eating. You still need glucose in your body, and where a lot of it will be coming from, since it's not coming from the diet, is you're going to be eventually breaking down amino acids or breaking down proteins, and some of these will go to the liver, be converted to glucose, so you can still fuel your brain and all the essential organs that require glucose in your body. Um, in addition to amino acids, if you're in a state where you need to make glucose, so gluconeogenesis is the um, process of making glucose in your body from something else. Okay, this is not coming from diet. And so, in addition to amino acids, we can also use some other substrates. So, for example, when we're breaking down fat or triglycerides, in addition to the fatty acids, you get, uh, if you remember, a triglyceride has that glycerol on it. That glycerol can be used to make um, glucose. So this is important. If you stop eating, you're going to break down muscle, which will give you amino acids to make <coughs> glucose. And if you break down fat, it'll give you glycerol to make glucose. And obviously, you, the glucose is essential to keep your brain going. If that stops, you go into a coma and you die. Um, the other important point that I want to reiterate here is the fat cannot be made into glucose. And I've talked about this before, and I'll talk about it some more. Um, those carbons, if, if I go back for a second, I think I went through it better yesterday, but remember when the, the, the fat comes into here, and when this goes around, everything is lost. These two carbons are lost, so there's nothing left to go back up to glucose if we need it. So only things that enter down in here can go give a net gain of glucose. So the fat, fatty acids themselves cannot be used to make glucose. It's a very, very important point. The exception is there's some odd chain fatty acids, but I'm not going to, you don't have to worry about that. This is a really minor thing. Okay, so um, the other path, another pathway, um, or I guess I should just highlight the important points for gluconeogenesis here before I move on here. So um, I just talked about this, the carbons from acetylcholine are lost as CO2. But when we make glucose, okay, we have amino acids coming in, or we have uh, glycerol coming in, feeding into the TCA cycle here. And what happens is it's, it's not a reversal of glycolysis. There's some steps are the same, but it's, it's in general going back upstream to make glucose. So glycolysis is coming here and uh, gluconeogenesis is going back up, okay? Um, so again, these carbons have to come from these intermediates, these metabolites of the citric acid cycle, which is very important. And this primarily happens in the liver, right? The most important site for glucose production. Okay, so the other anabolic pathway we're going to talk about is making fat. Right? So we're not fasting now. Now we're in some sort of fed state. And um, specifically, when we synthesize fatty acids, this is mostly coming from excess, uh, usually carbohydrates in our diet. Right? And I've used this example before. You go to Olive Garden, you have that big bowl of pasta. Right? That glucose is all going to come in your blood. First thing that's going to happen is your body's going to use it for energy, whatever its needs are. The second thing that's going to happen is you can convert the extra to glycogen in your muscle and your liver. And the third thing, I mean, if you eat a big bowl, you're going to have still plenty of energy left. And so your body's going to convert it to fat for use later on, tomorrow, the next day, a month from now, a year from now. And what this process is, is de novo fatty acid synthesis, okay? Um, it's primary in the liver. There is also some in adipose tissue in humans as well. Um, and again, primarily from excess carbohydrates. And we do this, it's a little bit like fat oxidation, where instead of ch chopping it off into two carbons, we actually add two carbons at a time, up to a uh, certain number. So we take acetyl-CoA and we basically put them together like little Legos until we get um, eight, ten of them together, where we get a fatty acid. Okay? And this is stimulated by glucose. So glucose is what drives this, you need it. And then 
Insulin, again, is telling your body you have plenty of energy. So it's going to tell your cells and your liver and adipose to take up glucose and to convert it and store it for later use. So the alcohol metabolism, uh, we kind of went over already. Um, I didn't focus so much on the energy part of it. I'm going to just do that real briefly now. We talked about these different pathways. Again, uh, not that important. What I want to mention now is uh, highlight a couple things is that, remember when we metabolize alcohol or ethanol, we get acetyl-CoA. And the other thing you get is you get NADH. Okay? So you get a fair amount of NADH produced. So these will all lead to um, obviously more energy production. And when you have too much of this coming in, because ethanol comes in the liver very fast, and it comes down here, so you're going to get a lot of acetyl-CoA and a lot of NADH. And when you meet your energy needs, this acetyl-CoA won't enter the cycle anymore. It's going to be diverted to make fat. So that's why this is such an important branch point. Okay? It can go to make energy, or it can go to build, uh, for example, fatty acids and store them. And so in the liver, when you're an alcoholic, the reason you get fatty liver is there's so much coming in here, it's way more than the liver can need. And it gets converted to fat, and that fat gets stuck there. And then after years and years, your liver basically craps out on you. OK, so all of this is, um, I dare say, straightforward. But it's, it's just pathways, A to B, B to C type thing. But it's, it's not that simple in real life. It's extremely highly regulated. Okay, And we're not going to go into. Um, all the details. You could take your, do your entire PhD on trying to understand one of these pathways. Okay? It's very, very complicated. Um, but it's extremely important because if we skip a meal or stop eating, if our body doesn't adapt, we die like very fast. Right? So our body is really adept at adjusting to our nutritional inputs. And, and we call this homeostasis. So in other words, you're able to maintain a normal state um, when there's big changes in nutrient intake or things like this. Okay, so you can eat a meal, you can starve for three days, and you'll still be alive. So what regulates a lot of these things are energy levels. Okay? So if you have a lot of energy around, a lot of ATP, it'll say, tell your cells, it'll tell these pathways that you don't need to make anymore. There's plenty. Okay? There's plenty of energy, so slow these pathways down. Uh, if there's low energy charge, it says make more energy. Okay? And hormones play a role in this. We talked about insulin promoting this. Um, glucagon does the opposite. If you exercise, you're releasing hormones like uh, epinephrine or adrenaline. And those act more like um, uh, glucagon, which say, make, make energy. Make energy to fuel my muscles. Okay? So those hormones play an important role um, in exercise as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, some of the nutrients in your diet actually regulate these things. So going back to those dietary supplements that I talked about um, before class started, many of them aren't used. You don't use those carbons for anything. They simply regulate some of these pathways. So I talked about the thermogenesis, but they can regulate fat synthesis or gluconeogenesis or whatever it may be. So some of them act as like little signals okay, that can fine tune um, your metabolism. And this gets tricky because everybody, uh, at least from a weight loss standpoint, you know, the easy way is to find the magic bullet, right? To take the pill, the weight just falls off, everybody's happy, you don't have to do anything. In reality, most of these pills or, you know, whatever extracts, the effects they have are generally very, very modest, okay? <coughs> There's so many inputs regulating these systems when you have a little bit more caffeine or have a little bit more whatever it may be. Um, it generally doesn't have a big effect on all of these pathways that I've talked about. So this is, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go through this extensively here. I think it's, it's somewhat important to understand where some of these things are happening. Um, 
I don't know that you, you, you don't need to memorize where all these are. I hit a few things. So I think knowing that, for example, glycolysis happens in the cytosol and that a lot of processes happen in the mitochondria. So the citric acid cycle, beta oxidation, um, and electron transport chain, all of these happen in the mitochondria. So I guess if there's one take home point from all this to know is that the mitochondria are absolutely critical for energy production in your body, right? So I've got a few slides here now that um, I think are kind of important, and I would encourage you to try and think through these because they, um, they kind of interlink these different pathways that I've talked about. And so we've kind of looked at metabolism mostly in a pathway, but all of these different nutrients and all these pathways are really kind of interlinked. So, um, you know, if we talk about glucose, we store it as glycogen. Um, but then we can break it down through glycolysis. It goes to acetyl-CoA. We talked about all these pathways, right? And then you can make glucose this way. We can break fat down. We can synthesize fat. Um, and then the proteins can come uh, in here as well. So I, th I think it's kind of good to, to put all these together and, and think about how they're interrelated. Um, you don't need to know this for now, but I'm just giving you a little heads up. Because later on in this class, we're going to talk about various other nutrients, like vitamins and minerals. And really, the main purpose of those vitamins and minerals, one of, they do many things, but a primary purpose of them is to help you get energy. And this just lists all of the different nutrients that are involved in these different pathways. Okay? So in order to um, take acetyl-CoA to energy, so citric acid cycle and electron transport chain, all of these are involved in that process. And so as you would imagine, when you get, become deficient in a certain vitamin, for example, or a certain mineral that is listed here, it can have a pretty big impact on your metabolism. Or if you're an athlete and performance is very important, if you become limiting in one of these, it can limit your performance, your, your peak performance. So that's something to consider as well. Okay, so the last little bit is what I want to do is I kind of want to put all this stuff in a context of kind of the two spectrums of metabolism, at least the way I think about it. When we're in a fasted state, so we haven't eaten, or when we're in a fed state. Because metabolism is really about coordination of these pathways, okay? It's about keeping us alive. And so how does our body adapt to skipping a meal? So the last meal you ate was dinner last night, and you skipped breakfast today. What is going on in your body? I would consider you being in a fasted state right now. Um, and so what are the important things going on? So we know that fasting would encourage, remember, fa you're not getting food from your diet right now. So this is the time, this is like when you lose your job, right? When you lose your job, you're not going to go out and buy a whole bunch of crap. You're going to start taking money out of the bank, right? Well, if you're stupid, you're going to buy a bunch of crap and then just send your credit card bill to your parents. But um, you're probably, if you're a good child, um, you're probably going to be taking money out of your accounts, uh, bugging some from your friends, doing whatever it is, right? So that's kind of what happens in the body, too. So when we're not getting food from the diet and we're fasting, um, what we're going to be doing is breaking down our stores. And our primary stores of energy are carbohydrate stores in the form of glycogen, fat stores in the form of adipose tissue, and protein um, stores in most of your body cells, especially muscle. Now, keep in mind that these are not, we don't just start breaking these down all equally. All right? They're kind of need dependent. So in a very short term fast, you're probably going to break them down um, mostly carbs. Okay? Because um, these can be replenished easy. And I don't know if I have... Uh, no, I don't. I, th this is a short term fast. Okay? But um, eventually, as your stores of carbohydrate become depleted, you're going to switch over and start breaking down more fat. And then if this extends out, let's say days, Okay, where you're not eating anything, then your protein will be broken down. But your body really likes to protect the protein. Okay? This will only be broken down when you, you kind of have to. So what happens to this? Your carbs get broken down in glucose, and you burn them. Glycolysis, citric acid cycle, ET, uh, electron transport chain. Your fat gets broken down, you burn it. If there's not enough carbs, you're going to make ketone bodies. Okay? Um, you also get the glycerol to uh, make glucose as well. Um, and amino acids will feed in here, and you can use these for energy. So this is glycogen breakdown, fat breakdown. Um, you could make ketone bodies. 
And also, as you extend this fast, gluconeogenesis is going to go up more and more over time. Okay, you're going to need that glucose. So again, as, you, as your duration increases, you're going to deplete this glycogen, and then you're going to switch over more to fat and protein. Okay, so that's kind of, um, even saying a fast isn't the same thing, because it changes pretty much every hour you're into the fast, and all these are very dynamically regulated. So that's what's happening at fast. So now um, you decide, okay, fasting sucks, I'm going to eat a meal, all right? So you go eat like 2,000 calories. What's going to happen? We call this feasting. You can just call it eating a meal too. But, um, so feasting encourages kind of the opposite. This is a state where we have a lot of energy coming in from the diet, right? And we're going to say, okay, we don't know when our next meal is going to be. I mean, we all do, but if you think about how we evolved, we didn't most of our human lifespan, right? Or human uh, evolutionary time. And so when we eat a meal, um, we're going to store it. So the glucose comes in, it gets stored as, the first thing of course is it used for energy. The first thing is meet our energy needs. Then after we've met our energy needs, it goes to glycogen. Okay, if there's more than that that we need, it goes to fatty acids and stored as triglycerides. Okay, we talked about this kind of process, one, two, three, of how it happens. Now the fat is going to come in, and you're going to store this. The fat will come in and be converted to triglycerides. The protein will come in and um, be used to make proteins in the body. And if there are some excess, it will flow to triglycerides, although this isn't usually too important. So the net result of this is after a meal, you're going to have plenty of energy stores, lots of glycogen and lots of triglycerides. And of course, triglycerides will mostly end up in adipose tissue. So what happens then if you're constantly in a feasting mode, right? This is obesity. Obesity, normal people are in, in usually a balance between calories in, calories out, fasting, refeeding. And um, the problem is, is that too many people are kind of only, always in this mode. They eat multiple meals a day, throughout the evening, snacks. They're never fasted, so to speak. And so it's just a constant, your foot's always on the gas. And you're always making, making, making. And that's why these will accumulate and um, you become obese. Okay? Yes? Yeah. So, so the question is, is it, and we talked a little bit about this, um, is it better to, to space out your meals through the day and eat smaller ones or eat a few big ones? And, you know, for a very long time, the general recommendation was eat lots of small meals throughout the day. And this is a really tricky one. There's a lot of debate on this. And um, I don't, I think that that statement has maybe fallen out a little bit. Um, it gets tricky because you want, I, I think probably the most important thing, and I mentioned this early in the semester, I'm not sure how important it is as far as the number of meals or, you know, if you eat five meals of 200 calories each or you eat one 1,000 calorie meal, right, um, over the course of a day. But I think what's really important is having this state of fasting at some point. So whether you eat, I think it's better to eat many little meals or a few big meals in a shorter window, but then have a period where you don't eat, okay? Um, you know, a lot of, this stuff is really emerging now where you, they try and at least one day a week or two days a week go for like a 16-hour fast or something like this. And that, it turns off some of these, these pathways and turns on some of the other ones. And we're thinking of it in the context of just, okay, how much fat do I have in our body? But we know, for example, um, when you're constantly in this mode, this promotes things like insulin is always around. And we know that if you always have insulin around, your likelihood of developing cancer goes up. Okay? There's people that lack uh, genes that basically make you uh, unresponsive to insulin. These people almost never get cancer. So there appears to be an important balance in your body is where you have to turn off this fed state and turn on that fasted state. Not just for calorie balance, but also because of all the behind-the-scenes changes that are going on that really affect your health. 
Okay, so I don't know if I can give you a true answer on the how many meals should I eat in this window versus you know, but because there's a lot of debate about that. But I, the take-home point again is I would make is is just limit that window. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. So, so the question was on on Ramadan. So Ramadan uh, is a religious holiday where you, um, you fast all day long, sunrise to sunset, or yeah, sunrise to sunset. You fast, and then you break the fast in the evening with usually a large meal. Um, it lasts for uh, roughly a month. And there's been uh, actually a lot of people looking at this, and this is this does have some beneficial health effects. And, uh, you know, you have to take a caveat with this. If you're pregnant or things like this, there can be concerns for the baby. But um, if you're, uh, people have done lots of studies with people that are obese or pre-diabetic. And they have things where they call it either alternate day fasting or um, intermittent feeding, intermittent feeding, where it's kind of the same concept as your, in the, inter, in the alternate day fasting, they go 24 hours without eating. And this has beneficial effects on you know, glucose control and all these things. And it's the same thing at Ramadan. Having that window of time where you're not eating can be very beneficial. So, plus you usually get to eat a lot of really good food at night, so it kind of, you know, you something to look forward to. But yeah, that's an interesting, um, and I've had several students in my graduate level class that have written research papers on this whole topic, and so that's kind of how I've become more familiar with it, but it's an interesting, and that's not just Ramadan, there's other religious things, uh, cultural things where fasting has occurred, and if you look, if you go back in the literature, and I haven't done this, but um, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, from even like the Greek philosophers, they have statements in there saying, if you want to improve your health, fast. You know, this has been known for a long time, but now we're just trying to understand the biology of it, see how it works. Um, and this, the, the, I think this is the last slide, um, just talks about a few concepts that I mentioned in our, in our um, class. The important one here is that um, fatty acids do not yield glucose and alcohol doesn't, okay? And these primarily go to, um, to fat. Everything can make fat, all right? So we're, we're, we've evolved to be very efficient at energy storage, all right? Um, and then for protein, again, the only thing that can go to make proteins is amino acids in your diet. So um, for glucose, we need carbs in our diet, glycerol, or amino acids. For, amino a for proteins in our body, we can only get them from eating amino acids. We can't make them, or all of them anyway. And for making fat, we can get it from anywhere. Any extra carbons that we don't need can be stuck as fat. And if you think about it, for survival, this is a good thing, right? We, we want to be able to, when you're scavenging and you find some, some dead animal or nuts and berries, you want to eat as much as you can and store it very efficiently. And so we have, we have done that. Okay, um, that is it. We are done a little early today. That's all right. This is a, a tough chapter to go through. Um, next time, uh, a couple questions here before I move on. So hang on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there was another slide. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 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 I had somehow inserted a blank one. Now I see it. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> Not quite yet. Got you guys all excited. Um, so, there's also some genetic components of this. And we call these inborn errors of metabolism. Now, most of you don't realize this, but when you were born, one of the very first things the nurse did is take a little blood sample from you. She pricked your little toe and took a blood sample. And within probably that very first day of life, they ran a battery of tests on that sample to see if you had any of these inborn errors of metabolism. So what these are is they're generally mutations in genes in some of those pathways we talked about. And if you don't catch it right away, they can have very, very severe consequences. Some of them, there's not much we can do, but some of them, through dietary changes or medication, you can actually treat or, or allow the person to live somewhat of a normal life. Um, so these are screened in newborns, and there's, there's hundreds of these, okay? I'm just gonna give you a few examples. Um, one that, uh, probably one of the most common ones is called phenylketonuria, or PKU. Okay? And this is where you can't metabolize a specific amino acid called phenylalanine. So um, what, they're, what, you, what they do is they treat you within days of birth 
because if you this accumulates and causes brain damage. And so throughout your life, you basically have to eat a very um, tailored diet that limits the amount of phenylalanine in your diet. Otherwise, it can cause very bad complications. Um, another one is uh, galactosemia. So this is you can't metabolize the sugar galactose, which is kind of a problem because if you remember milk, sugar has galactose in it. Um, so if you don't catch this pretty fast, it's a bad thing. That's why they do that screen right away. Um, and again, this can have pretty negative effects on the brain. And then there's uh, another one that's not so uncommon. It's called glycogen storage disease. And so you can store glycogen, but you can't break it down. Okay? So if you can't break it down, what happens when you fast? What's going to happen to your blood glucose? It's going to drop. Because that glycogen, normally you would break down, it would help supply the blood with glucose. And if you can't do that, um, you have to be very careful. So some people um, get what we call hypoglycemia, means low blood glucose. But again, you need to know this early on so that it can be monitored. There's a, a whole bunch of these. So uh, uh, yeah, question. Do they test for type 2 diabetes? There, as far as I know, there are no good type 2 diabetes uh, tests at, when you're an infant. There are some genes that kind of roughly predict it, not very accurately, but there's no known metabolic enzyme, anything you can test that will predict type 2 diabetes. Or type 1, for example, which is early onset, which is youth onset. There's nothing we can do to predict it. This is a big area of research, is trying to figure out markers that you can measure on day one that could predict disease later on in life, but for most of them, we're not there yet. So, any other questions? Okay, next time, uh, next week, we're going to cover, we're going to kind of apply this and talk about energy metabolism and weight balance, okay, and where calories are coming in and out and all sorts of obesity-related things. So, that, have a great weekend.